What a beautiful song. Oh God, I need you, oh I need you. So many different songs that have those words. I need thee every hour. I'm sure we can all think of all of the different um, songs, both contemporary and, and old, old hymns that have those, that, that acknowledgement that we need God. And that's why we join together. That's why we join together um, in worship anytime. But that's one of the other reasons why we join together in the Lenten season. And as, as we begin Lent uh, today on Ash Wednesday, as I mentioned, we do, uh, we are using a, this, this series that we've put together called Places of the Passion. And we'll, we're using Matthew's gospel to walk to, with Jesus to places like the Upper Room, to the Garden of Gethsemane, to Pilate's Judgment Hall, the Hill of G Golgotha, many places. But today we walk with Jesus to the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Its name resonates in the hearts of Christians, Jews, and Muslims alike, and echoes through centuries of shared and disputed history. Known in Hebrew as Yerushalayim and in Arabic as Al-Quds, it is one of the oldest cities in the world. It has been conquered, destroyed, and rebuilt time and time again, and every layer of its earth reveals a different piece of the past. While it has often been the focus of stories of division and conflict among people of different religions, they are all united in their reverence for this holy, holy ground. At the core of the, of, is the old city in Jerusalem, a maze of narrow alleyways and historic architecture that characterizes its four quarters, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, and Aramean. It is surrounded by a fortress-like stone wall and home to some of the holiest sites in the world. And we'll be talking about many of those Christian sites. Each quarter represents its own population. The Christians have two, because Arminians are also Christians, and their quarter, the smallest of the four, is one of the oldest Arminian centers in the world. It is unique in, in that their community has preserved its own particular culture and civilization inside the St. James Church and Monastery, which comprises most of their section. Over the next several weeks, we will explore more of this fascinating city, its history, and its significance. But tonight, let us look at the Gospel of Matthew which I read earlier and I mentioned that it begins when Jesus had finished all these sayings or the, the, the section that we read tonight. Matthew records five teaching blocks of Jesus, again, patterned after uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, as you know. But he, he patterns that, I believe, after that. And five times Matthew writes, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, Matthew 26, 1 that I read is the fifth and final time that Matthew writes that, when Jesus had finished all these sayings. So what's the point? Matthew is finishing the gospel, I believe, his gospel. He's wrapping things up. It's all coming to an end. You know, I, what, I'm the youngest of, of three children, and my older brother and sister worked, and my mother went uh, back into the works force um, when I was uh, in elementary school. And so uh, I would come home after school, get off the bus, and uh, I just kind of had a thing about storms. And we, our front room uh, had a big picture window facing directly west, which, of course, most of the storms would come from. And so uh, we had an organ there, and uh, my mom was an organist. And so if there was, kind of looked funny, like maybe there were going to be some storms, um, I would sit, it, it kind of, I look at it now and just think, boy, you know, no, wow, how neurotic could you be? But I would sit on this organ bench and just look out the front window and just kind of very often would see those storm clouds just gathering because, of course, it's flat, right? We're in northern Ohio, so it would just be flat. You could just see the clouds coming. And then uh, every once in a while, I would just turn and just play some hymns on the organ, right? And that would bring me great comfort. And then I'd kind of sneak a look back out, you know, at all the storms coming. 
Well, that's exactly what's kind of happening in our Gospels or as we begin our Lenten journey. There's a, 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 we know that it's going to end in a massive storm, right? Now, we know again that the, the clouds will clear and there will be the resurrection of Christ. But up until then, and again, we, it's really, I was going to say cheating, but that's really not the word I want. Um, but it's cheating ourselves of a real one-on-one -on -one experience with God if we just skip Lent and go straight to Easter, right? Because we miss all of the sacrifice that Jesus um, did for us and, and what God gave to us. And we miss all of the self-reflection and, um, and looking at our sin. And again, you know, you, you hear that word and some people kind of cringe about that, but it's really true, right? We all are sinners, every one of us. And the, the good news is that we, we just need to look at ourselves, look inside ourselves, and, and God forgives our sins over and over and over, thanks be to God. So to me, Lent, even though we're wearing black and maybe it's a more somber time in some ways, to me it's a very life-affirming time. And I, and I pray that you find that to be the same on your journey. Because again, we know that there's, there's gonna be some bad times ahead first, right? For Jesus and for all of us too. He said, Jesus said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Matthew 26, 1 through 2. This will be Christ's last Passover in Jerusalem. He's about to be crucified, dead, and buried. Jesus sees the storm coming. Maybe those living in Texas and in the South saw that snow arriving and, and, and their power going out and saw no way out. We all know of different, what it feels like to be in bad situations, what it feels like to be stuck in vulnerable, exposed places when a storm hits. Think about all the different things from maybe seemingly insignificant uh, when we're younger, but yet really important things that maybe some of our youth go through. Uh, did you get cut from the team? Do you remember that feeling? Uh, did you lose the love of your life? That's huge. Are your finances tight? Are you, are you having trouble with your kids trying to raise them? Is old age getting the best of you? My, my Uncle Clarence used to always say, the golden years are not so golden. Are you really, really tired of things right now? Just tired of the pandemic, tired of worrying about this and that, trying to have to act a certain way, trying to keep all the interpersonal relationships all going and, and nobody getting offended by just diff different things. Are you just tired of life right now? I don't know if you remember or not, but um, when I was younger, so this was pre-sitting on the Oregon bench pathetically looking out the western window, uh, my grandmother lived with us. And I remember her watching The Secret Storm. So that's, uh, that's an old TV soap opera that's going to bring back maybe some memories for uh, people of a certain age watching uh, tonight. But do you remember that? The Secret Storm. Um, and think about that, you know? That's got to be the worst kind of storm. Now, I'm sure it probably maybe was not a great TV show. I was too little, so I don't really remember how good or bad The Secret Storm soap opera was. But think about it in real terms. A secret storm is the worst kind of storm because you feel so alone, right? It's a secret because we're ashamed and we're embarrassed. And we're, we, we just don't know who, who even to turn to. So we keep all those things inside, all of those sins inside. And we don't tell a soul, much less maybe even admit it to God. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, that was what we're talking about, isn't it? You know, we say in our, our tradition here at this church is forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Um, I know for many of us and myself growing up, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And they both mean sin, right? And I really wish sometimes that we could, I even thought about doing that for Lent, but I, I, don't, I wasn't sure how upset people would get of having us try to just say the word sin, forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. So we probably won't do that tonight, but maybe we'll do that for Sunday, I'm not sure. 
But that's really straightforward, isn't it? And stark, that's exactly what we're doing when we trespass against someone or when someone owes us um, a, a debt or when we, we are, are taking from our debtors. And what is Christ's response to our sin? Does he condemn us? Does he lock us up and throw away the key? Do you remember what Jesus says in Matthew 26 too? You know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered to be crucified. That is how Jesus takes care of our sins. Jesus walks to a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. At Golgotha, Jesus walks straight into the storm. In 2 Corinthians 5.19, Paul writes, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So Jesus willingly places himself in the middle of the storm. But can you hear him? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23.34. And what about Luke 23.43? Today you will be with me in paradise, he assures the robber with him. I thirst, and it is finished. Those poignant words that Jesus shares on the cross for each of us, for you. Are you stuck in a bad place? Jesus was stuck in a bad place. Are you hurting? Jesus was hurting. Are you bleeding? Jesus bled. Do you feel like you're just gasping for air? Jesus gasped for air. Are you crying? Jesus cried. Again, we know the shortest verses in the Bible, right? Jesus wept. Is your heart breaking? Jesus' heart was absolutely broken. So what does it all mean? It means that we are not alone in this storm. And it doesn't, nothing has to be secret. We can open up our lives, our hearts, our souls, our thoughts to God because he knows them anyway. So all we need to do is just admit those. We are never alone in our storm. To the father haunted by angry outbursts, Jesus speaks. To the husband and wife who barely talk to each other anymore, Jesus speaks. To all of us exposed to the constant storm of sin, Jesus speaks. Can you hear him? What does he say? I forgive you. I love you. So what should we do when we're stuck in a bad place, a massive, life-threatening, Category 5 kind of storm? When it looks as though everything is going to be wiped off the map, should we freak out? Should we panic? Should we find excuses or, or start making up conspiracy theories? Should we do something that we regret for the rest of our lives? No, no, and no. God knows how to get his people safely through the storm. Isn't that the message of Passover? God doing whatever it takes to get Israel safely through unpredictable, ferocious, and hellish storms in that case, called Egypt. There was the Pharaoh with his whips and bricks and bag of tricks. There was the Red Sea, which looked like a dead end. And then there were some horses and chariots. What happened? The Israelites walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. God knows how to get his people safely through the storm. Isn't that the message, again, of Christ's Passover meal? as well when we share in communion. With his true body and blood, Jesus takes us from a stormy place to another place, a place of peace in his presence, a place to lay our burdens down. And maybe that's why you're so exhausted if you are. Maybe that's why you're feeling hopeless if you are. Maybe that's why you're just not sure where to turn or where you've just been depressed or where you've just been so angry. Maybe you're, you're just so worn out from carrying those burdens. Let those go right now, right now. Take a deep breath, take some Salah time and just lay those burdens down 
right at the cross of Jesus. Just as we can never sin too much for Christ to forgive, we do need to take time to intentionally and sincerely reflect on our shortcomings, on our mistakes, on our sin, in order for us then to be able to feel that weight removed, to arrive on the other side to a place of forgiveness and second chances and rebirth.